I remain, as always, your humble host, Osgood. Last month, we observed the centennial of the armistice which ended the Great War. World War I, as we call it today, as no one at the time could imagine war on such a scale ever happening again. The Great War marks a turning point in our relationship with our technology. As you see, we went off to the front lines riding horse and cart, and then came back with tanks and monoplanes and entered the modern age. One hundred years since we became modern. One hundred years since we became modern. What a strange thought. Tonight's exhibit comes to us from author Santiago Eximeno, a Spanish genre writer who has published several novellas and collections, mainly horror literature and flash fiction. His work has been translated into English, Japanese, French, and Bulgarian. You can find him at eximeno.com or at Santiago Eximeno on Twitter. It will be read for us this evening by Mr. Alastair Stewart. Barbed Wire Fence by Santiago Eximeno Translated from the Spanish by Alicia L. Alonso The day I marched down to the front, my mother was standing next to me. Naturally, she wanted to hug me, but I couldn't reciprocate. Hurt by my inevitable rejection, she watched every single one of my moves, as if by doing so she could record them into her mind forever and let her memories of me impregnate the house. My father paid no attention to me. He walked from here to there on his crutches, crossing the living room of our small house like it was the scenario of a sports event. He moved a chair here, walked around the sofa there, walking dexterously on the wooden extensions he himself had built. He fantasized with the idea of self-mutilation, amputating his leg just below the knee like some mothers did to their sons to secure, for them, the life of a civil servant far away from death, from weapons, from change. He fantasized about getting a pay rise. If only he could muster up enough courage to cut just below the kneecap. My father would never understand what made me decide to go to the front. He was one of those selfish, incompetent men. He would never understand a patriot. As I sat at the back of the lorry that would take us to the enemy lines, I saw my mother crying, broken by her grief. I wanted to share her pain and cry like her, but that too was forbidden to me. So I just watched. Watched her standing in the middle of the village square, alone. Crying for my absence as she once cried for my brothers while the lorry drove us away to the horror of the Great War. I shared my journey with three other soldiers, all modified, just like me. Across from me sat two trenches, next to me a bayonet, the kind with a sharp-edged weapon instead of an arm and an elusive look in their eyes. The trenches hid their faces behind the huge, rusty engine that was their mask. Steel propellers sprouted from the axis. They were nearly twenty inches wide and grazed the vehicle's ceiling, making any movement uncomfortable. They remained silent with their hands crossed over their lap. I didn't know if they could really speak. I'd never seen any of them so close up. I remembered them from the newspaper, from the photos of the war front that showed many of them working the land, drilling it to build the tunnels that would shelter us from the enemy. But here, 
close up, their faces disappeared into a dark, urine-infested hole, a pit that made it impossible to discern one single human feature that might have survived the modification. Fag? asked the bayonet, and I said no, because I thought he was offering one. He was actually asking me for a smoke, and my negative gesture made him uncomfortable. He lowered his eyes, and with his unarmed hand fumbled inside imaginary pockets of his uniform, to no avail. The roar of the lorry's engine kept me awake, but all I wanted to do was shut my eyes and get to wherever I needed to be to fight the enemy, to win a war that wasn't mine, to die like my brother. Eventually, the day's tension had the better of me. Eventually, I let sleep win. And I dreamt. I dreamt of German soldiers, their faces covered by gas masks sprouting tubes that went inside their torsos. I dreamt of armored cars with human faces, of Zeppelin airships driven by faceless men bombarding our small villages. And I dreamt of my father dragging his mutilated body through the village square while my brother, tethered to the ruins of the biplane that had become an unbreakable part of his body, roared with laughter and cried tears of blood. I woke up, startled, sweating, and looked out the lorry's window to feel the breeze on my face, and then I saw them up there, so close and so far away, so majestic. Biplanes. Men joined to linen-covered platforms through steel wires flew over the battlefields, first on their reconnaissance missions and then on bombing tasks. When we got off the lorry, it was already dark, but a handful of them still fluttered above our heads, silhouetted by the full moon. My brother had been one of them. Until a German shot him down, I still remember the fragments of his modified body, broken like the wood that covered the greater part of his limbs on the day they gave us his body back. The lorry stopped next to a small outpost, nothing but a few badly stacked sandbags and a sentry covering the entrance to the commanding area in the trench. Beyond that, we could sense the front, the wasteland that separated our two small subterraneous cities, paradises for rats and abandoned souls. I raised my hand to salute the man who approached us. He was a lieutenant, most likely the same age as me. Welcome to the front, lads, he said. Delighted to see you. But his eyes contradicted his words. He stared at us with the expression of a young girl entering a fair booth with her boyfriend, dragged into the stinking darkness and terrified by the prospect of seeing a horror of nature. His pupils dilated even more when he saw me standing in front of him. Son, how much do you weigh? He asked me. I stood naked in front of him, in front of them all, actually. My skin had been modified to withstand the cold, and the soles of my feet had been altered so that they would not feel the dampness of the mud we trod on. They certainly wouldn't want to lose two years' work over some damned trench feet. Thus, the alleged frailty of my body, necessary in order to correctly position it, was just that. Alleged. I didn't need his compassion nor even his affection. I needed to be allowed to be part of the front. I needed to earn my wages. Still, I answered respectfully. He was, after all, a lieutenant. Five stone, sir. The lieutenant nodded, removed his cap, rubbed his forehead with his hand. Fine. Fine. We're, we're going to spread out. Son, go with the sergeant. There's another one like you waiting with him. He'll take you to your posts. Trenches, please follow me, and you too. He pointed to the bayonet, who followed with his head down. It was starting to rain. I walked past an assault sergeant, the kind with an armoured head and loopholes instead of eyes. He didn't talk much, understandably. His face had been modified to the point where his mouth was nothing but a badly drawn slot. It was a necessity that could not be eliminated. He still needed to feed. He pointed the way to me with gestures. The rain was intensifying, and the walls of the trenches were crumbling down like rye bread. As I waddled in the soaking mud, I passed modified and unmodified alike, men staring at me with both repugnance and respect. To the lot of them, we were new. Different. We were the surprise factor. The one thing the Germans would not be expecting. We were the barbed wire. 
I was confused by the subterraneous maze, could hardly keep up with the sergeant. With every step, my feet sunk into the mud, tripping over rats, live and dead alike. The rain was now a storm. The night was darkness. Perfect. The sergeant raised a hand and we stopped. There was my comrade. He would have gone unnoticed to anyone else, but I could sense the impossible contortion of barbed wire on the man whose hand I would soon be shaking. I said goodbye to the sergeant and climbed a small wooden ladder to the exterior. I felt fear, of course. Panic. They could shoot me that very instant, and I would not be able to do anything to avoid it, but nothing happened. It was the dead of night. It rained, and we all knew it was on those nights that the troops moved forward, and the trench wars were flooded in mud and blood. Hello? said the other barbed wire. Hello? I whispered. I shook his hand before placing my body in a position that would have been impossible to another human being. Together, we formed a barbed wire fence. I felt the spikes of my comrades' wires sinking into the palm of my hand. I felt the pain. The pain. A pain that would keep me alert and awake because they would be coming tonight. They would advance under cover of the darkness of the rain, and there we would be. Waiting. Waiting to embrace them. Our narrator for this evening, Alastair Stewart, is the host of Pseudopod, an escape pod, runs Escape Artists, Inc., and is professionally enthusiastic about genre fiction on the internet. He lives in the UK with the love of his life and their ever-expanding herd of microphones. Follow him on Twitter as at Alastair Stewart or at his blog, the man of words, and to come visit us again, sir. I think I will keep the war artifacts on for a little bit longer here in the gallery. I don't often show them. As horror goes, they exude a more somber atmosphere than the October exhibits. It brings down the mood. But, then again, it does bring in the history majors, and those history majors, they do like to talk. I think it's time that I brew myself a little honey and licorice tea with a bit of mallow root, and let my voice recuperate for the morrow, which means it's time for you to be on your way. Do come visit us next time at the Gallery of Curiosities. Gallery of Curiosities is produced under a Creative Commons International 4.0 non-commercial attribution no derivatives license. That means you cannot sell it, change it, or make a transcript, but you may certainly share it with everyone you know. In fact, I encourage it. And also the ones even maybe you don't know so well. That is how social media works, is it not? Our theme song is, as always, Ashes, Ashes by Deus Ex Vapora Machina. This episode was produced at the very beginning of December of 2018. For full show notes, visit us on the web at gallerycurious.com. Oh, 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 oh,